Hey everyone, you're watching WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security news each week. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 15th, 2012. In this week's video, I'll talk about some software updates. I'll give you an update on one of last week's stories. I'll talk about a new nation state sponsored threat called Miniflame. And finally, I'll throw in a couple of game related security stories just for fun. Let's start with the obligatory software security updates. This week, there was a humongous quarterly patch from Oracle and a related patch from Apple as well. As you probably know, Oracle has a quarterly patch release cycle which fell on the Tuesday of this week. They released this humongous patch that fixed 109 vulnerabilities in a wide range of their products, including things like all their Sun products such as Solaris, some of their virtualization products like VirtualBox, and of course their database products like Oracle Database Server and MySQL. If you use any of those Oracle products or the many other ones listed in this advisory, you should definitely check out their critical patch update and load up the appropriate patches. They also released a big Java SE patch that fixed about 30 vulnerabilities in Java, which is a very, very popular web plugin used to interpret Java applications. You probably have it on your computer. Uh, this Java patch was probably more serious as it fixed 10 uh, super critical uh, vulnerabilities. They were rated 10 on the CVSS scale, which is the top rating. So if you have Java, go get it. I wrote stories about both of these updates on our WatchGuard Security Center, so you can check it out there. On top of that, Apple also released their OS 10 Java updates. Essentially, Apple packages their own version of Java with OS 10, so whenever Oracle updates, Apple has to update their products as well. However, in this particular security update, besides fixing the vulnerabilities, Apple also disabled the Java applet plugin from all their web browsers. This means if you go to a web page that uses Java in the future, Apple's going to tell you to go to Java's to Oracle's page to get the latest version of Java, which will make it easier for Apple. They won't have to try to keep following Oracle's patch cycle. In any case, read about this on WatchGuard Security Center and be sure to go out and get all those patches. Next, a quick update on one of last week's stories. Uh, last week I mentioned how the U.S. House of Representatives released a report talking about Huawei and LTE, two Chinese manufacturers, basically saying any equipment coming from them poses a danger to U.S. businesses because they're insecure, they may steal intellectual property, and so on. I gave you my comments on, on that story last week. Basically, there are some issues with Huawei copying some of Cisco's intellectual property, and their routers have been known for having many security vulnerabilities. However, I didn't really think that the U.S. government's actually confirmed this whole backdoor issue. Well, this week, the, the White House released some information saying that they had been surveying thousands of or 8,000 Huawei customers, and so far they found no evidence of a backdoor, which kind of confirms my opinions as well. Next up is Miniflame. Uh, one of WatchGuard's partners, Kaspersky, who's been releasing a whole bunch of information about many advanced persistent threats or, or attacks that come from nation states that are, are targeting a lot of organizations in the Middle East. This week they released new information about a a new piece of malware that's related to both the flame and gauze uh, viruses or worms that I've been talking about in past episodes. They found a component which they call mini flame. Essentially, this is a component that can work on its own, or it could also plug into either flame or gauze, so it draws a connection between those two different advanced threats. Essentially, mini flame is just a RAT, which stands for Remote Access Trojan. It's really the same kind of Trojan that a bot herder might use in a botnet to gain full backdoor control of a victim. According to Kaspersky's research, uh, not many people have been infected with this Trojan, maybe around 50. It's a very, very targeted attack that's only been loaded on, on, on certain systems. In fact, probably not your system. Nonetheless, it's interesting to see the underworkings of all these malware components that nation states seem to be using against each other. Now, the good news is if Kaspersky's talking about it, we have signatures for this already. We use Kaspersky in some of our products. So so even though this is a super targeted threat, it probably won't ever infect your computers, do know you're probably still protected from it if you're using any of our security appliances. 
Next, I want to comment on what I think is the conclusion of a long-term story about the NASA hacker. Uh, I've never talked about this in, in our, my weekly podcast because this is a story that started 10 years ago. A hacker from the UK called Gary McKinnon was caught uh, gaining access to uh, a, a lot of US government sites, particularly NASA and a bunch of other Department of Defense sites. And really the, the story is this guy is, is not a modern criminal hacker trying to steal money or even intellectual property. He's kind of a conspiracy theorist. He suffers from Asperger's. And, and he really was looking for some sort of proof of extraterrestrial life that he thinks the U.S. government is hiding from the world. So he hacked a bunch of government computers, gained some access, and in some cases he, he accidentally downed some networks. So Gary has been going through the court system in his country for a long time. The U.S. has been trying to extradite him so we can actually prosecute him under some cyber attack laws. Uh, and this has been going on for years and years. Well, finally this week, uh, the U.K. government actually said they're not going to extradite uh, Gary McKinnon or the NASA hacker. Basically they say uh, it goes against his human rights because he suffers from Asperger's. So I have a couple opinions on this. One of the first opinions is I really do think we need to get tougher on prosecuting people against cyber criminal acts. We need more cyber security laws, particularly ones that talk about criminal cyber attacks, so that we can better prosecute the bot herders and the, uh, the banking Trojan creators that are stealing our money. However, in this case, Gary McKinnon actually did this attack years and years ago, literally probably a decade ago. And frankly, I do not classify him in the same group as modern cyber criminals that are stealing money. Granted, what he did was wrong, and perhaps he should be punished for it, but really one of the worries from many of the people that are fighting for Gary McKinnon was that the U.S. government would make an example of him and, and prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law to show other cyber criminals that, that we're not going to take it. Frankly, I don't think Gary McKinnon's attack was of this level. In any case, it's something to think about, and I think that uh, lawyers will be talking about this case for a while, and it may have some repercussions on, on partnerships between between international agencies as well. So let's finish up with two fun security related stories. The first is a zero day vulnerability against the Steam network. If you're a gamer, you probably know that Steam is a distribution network where millions and millions of gamers can download and play games. It's created by Valve, the makers of Half-Life, and has become super popular. During the week, uh, some researchers from a group called Revuln released data about vulnerabilities in the Steam network. Essentially, the vulnerability has to do with Steam URIs. So if you see Steam colon backslash backslash in your browser, uh, that's a special URI that redirects your browser to Steam applications, you know, Steam backend stuff. Well, this research group found a way to leverage flaws in the way that URI passes parameters. Uh, they found all kinds of different issues. One of the issues allowed them to uh, 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 change parameters in Steam URIs to actually write files text files on your system. And while uh, writing text files doesn't sound scary, they found a way to write a batch file in one of your startup directories so that they could literally cause, it, uh, cause your computer to install malware upon startup. So these are some pretty significant vulnerabilities. Uh, now currently there's no perfect fix for it. The two things you can do is you can either get your browser operating system to start ignoring Steam URIs. Now of course this would be tough because some of the functions of Steam may not work as well as they're supposed to. And the other option is uh, for Valve to somehow fix this on that back end and maybe scrub some of the parameters they allow you to pass through Steam v uh, URIs. In any case, I don't think many attackers are exploiting this in the wild, but it is a consideration. If you are a gamer like I am and you use Steam, you might want to follow this research and pay attention to see if Valve fixes it. So at the beginning of all these episodes, I promise to summarize the biggest information and network security stories every week. This is not the biggest story of the week. In fact, I admit this story I'm only talking about because it follows one of my interests. If you haven't seen it yet, The Walking Dead is a fantastic series I've been watching since it first started. It's a zombie uh, apocalypse series that's based on a comic. Anyways, the security story is this week uh, researchers found 
that attackers were leveraging The Walking Dead to spread malware or scams. Basically, they'd advertise Walking Dead streaming sites where you could, could stream episodes of The Walking Dead. And if you went to these sites, they'd either redirect you to some advertising networks, or in some cases, they'd try to entice you into downloading a The Walking Dead EXE file. And of course, this file was malware. So while this isn't the biggest story of the week, and I doubt everyone's really run into this, I did want to talk a little bit about The Walking Dead. So watch out for, for this particular scam. If you're looking to watch Walking Dead online, I'd recommend going to legitimate sources like iTunes or whatever. That's the security news this week. I hope to see you next time. And speaking of next time, next week I'll be attending Gartner's IT Expo conference. And as a result, I'll have to do an on-the-road edition of my weekly video. But you can still expect it. It might just post either a little earlier or a little later, depending on my travel. In the meantime, if you'd like to continue to get regular security news, I recommend you follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, and I also post under the at WatchGuard Tech alias as well. You can also visit the WatchGuard Security Center blog, where I actually uh, post the write-up for this video, which also contains a whole bunch of links referring to the different stories I talk about every week. In any case, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.